Okay, thank you for the... I was too fast. <laughs> Um, but also DevOps is a bit about performance and being fast and keeping like side performance, so maybe not too bad. Um, so what we want to talk about is a bit for at first about um, what DevOps actually means for an organization and also with um, the experience of Alexandra and Georgia, um, what that meant in their organization, um, what we have to do to actually make uh, DevOps practices, introducing them into your company successful, and then also we may dive down a bit deeper into some practice and the, how they can help you prevent disasters in engineering. Um, also, I want to make this as uh, interactive as possible, so anytime you have any questions, just like raise your hand in between and we can do this. Also, um, you can just, if I don't see you, just throw stuff at me at, until I notice. Hopefully not too hard things or too wet things or something like this. Um, so. But I also have some things prepared. So uh, if you're wondering about the laptop, this is all things I have prepared. If I'm making notes, I'm not uh, chatting on Facebook. It's more like making notes for more questions. Um, for us, it's also very good to know a bit more about you and about what, where you're coming from, um, just to judge a bit what we should talk about more. So who of you is actually, would say, is doing DevOps or is a DevOps in their company? So I can. Raise hands. Um, who's like a developer, who would um, phrase themselves as a developer? An operations guy, girl, project manager, or any kind of manager? Okay, so a bit evenly split between developers, operations, and people in between that say they're DevOps. Okay, great. Um, so to start it off, it would be great if you just quickly could introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, uh, my name is Bastian. I'm working in a um, site durability engineering team in our company uh, where I'm working mostly on um, de deployment automata automation and monitoring infrastructure. Um, and it would be great if you could introduce yourself as well and especially what DevOps means for you and for your organization. Yep. Hello, everyone. My name is Giorgio Russo. I'm part of DevOps team in Ericsson, Romania. Um, as a um, type of business we're handling with, um, we are delivering for a platform called Device Connectivity Platform, which is suits uh, in the M2M business, machine to machine. And we in DevOps mostly are handling um, BSS application landscape. Um, yeah. um, what kind of application landscape? Sorry. BSS. BSS. What does it mean? Like billing, mediation zone, um, uh, CRM type of applications. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, when it comes to what DevOps means in practice for us, well, I think um, it initially begin, began a few years back, and it meant practically everything that was failing between chairs, let's say, between developers and, and operations. Um, it was an initial requirement, basically, from, from R&D uh, to have a set of guys, uh, more skill set, let's say, with a developer mindset and some operational uh, background or, yeah, background. And we started with, uh, let's say, solving third level support of type of tickets, including bug fixing and code changes, uh, adopting uh, developer yeah, developers methodologies so to speak mm. and so your background comes actually from operations then. mine's mm. personally yes the team is kind of even i mean some of them are mostly developers some of them are mostly operational guys um okay and we continue this type of activities by adding uh, capacity uh, system integration type of activities uh, automation was uh, is nowadays high up on our agenda uh, this, this type of things. And deployments, of course, yeah. Not, okay. not forget about it. Great. Hi, I'm uh, Alexandra. I'm from Metro Systems Romania, have been working in the company for six years, and I have about uh, 10 years experience, mostly in operations. Uh, currently, I am uh, the product owner of the site reliability engineering team in uh, Metro Systems Romania. We provide generic support to more than 20 verticals, which means dozens, thousands of services and, uh, and microservices. Uh, how we do this is through automation. 
Uh, in Metro Systems uh, Romania, we started the DevOps transformation a few years back, I guess about two to three years ago. And uh, the DevOps transformation was quite successful and is still ongoing on some minor teams because the company is quite large. Metro Systems Romania is the company that provides all the um, uh, technology stack for the Metro Group retailer companies. Okay, um, so you both basically said that you at the moment have dedicated DevOps teams, um, or team or teams, uh, that basically provide support for all the other vertical teams, feature teams, all the other engineering teams. Is this something that is working out for you well, or are you planning at some point also to introduce and spread this DevOps practices more into the vertical teams as well? Uh, in, uh, in Metro Systems, it's in fact a mixture. There are verticals that uh, have uh, a pure DevOps uh, formation with uh, people from operations uh, working together with the developers. And there are teams that uh, are based on a no-ops approach, uh, which means that there is a reliability engineering slash DevOps team supporting uh, the development teams. Has this no ops approach? Why is that? Um, what is the reason for having a team then with a no ops approach? Can you give an example, maybe also for uh, that? Yeah, there there is an example. Like uh, you have uh, a big application that is split between multiple microservices. Uh, they um, the application also has uh, multiple verticals. In, in the microservices world, there is the rule that uh, the code should not be uh, interchangeable, uh, should not be shared between uh, the uh, multiple uh, services, uh, which means that we come, we come in as uh, reliability engineers, as overall responsibility over the whole application and provide support and best practices and share, uh, share the information between, between the teams. How's it for you? Well, we are actually began. We have began for a few months now the process of transformation, and basically uh, we lean towards, let's say, the DevOps concept in the overall R and D teams. And nowadays, it's more like a mixture. It's a yeah. It's a hybrid, let's okay. say, setup. Okay, great. Um, so you already said like you're doing also, uh, especially a lot of site reliability engineering to keep the platform stable and fast, performant. Um, as war stories are usually like very interesting thing, can you maybe describe like one example for a disaster or something breaking uh, somewhere where uh, DevOps principles helped you and how they helped you? Yeah, of course, things, <laughs> things break and they break all the time when you do uh, rollouts, when you do deployments, so that is quite natural. One of the disasters that, uh, that we handled was related to the Kubernetes minions that simply would not uh, get uh, up again after uh, a deployment. Uh, the DevOps Practice helped us a lot in uh, seeing this before the customer would uh, would see it, based on the monitoring and the dashboards that uh, that we have, and mitigating it as we did an automated uh, script. In case this happens, then it has to self heal. Do you also so great. automation a lot? Okay. Do you also have some war story for us? Something where you? Oh, by the way, who broke something in the last month on production? Okay, I think the rest who didn't raise their hand were on vacation in the last month or were yeah. lying. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I have a short story uh, which kind of changed the mindset that we mm -hmm. had. Um, in practice, one and a half year back. Uh, we were still deploying uh, in the, let's say, old-fashioned way, meaning that for a window of approximately three hours, we are basically putting the platform down, doing the deployment on all Is the it, applications. And okay, I have to ask again. You, so you put the platform offline for three hours to deploy uh, More something. or less, yeah. Interesting. Not all, not all, not all <laughs> applications, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was shooting up. I mean, uh, it was um, uh, accommodated, and the customers were 
well aware about this and uh, were quite fine with it, so it seemed to be easier, I suppose. Um, nevertheless, um, apart from the, let's say, commercial customers that we have had, which were operators, basically, telecom operators worldwide, we were also having one that was um, kind of in a demo um, um, set up, meaning that it was on the verge of becoming commercial. Mm -hmm. It was set up on the platforms, nevertheless it was not, uh, it was not uh, having all the services. Um, therefore, it was not announced that we will bring the platform down for some hours. And also due to the, let's say, uh, round clock, meaning that uh, we were doing deployments during night, nevertheless on their time zone it was quite a shiny day. <laughs> okay, uh, they, uh, I mean, we started the deployment exactly in the middle of uh, some demo towards a big oil company that was supposed to do a, quite a good deal with mm. them and also with us, of course. Uh, that was the moment when we basically decided that w definitely we should go for at least uh, a way to do deployments in a non-service affecting um, way. In so. in interesting, we have like a, in our company we had a similar problem once where we destroyed because of a deployment that we did uh, something during an investor meeting. Uh, so it was also not really great. Um, but we still got the investment in the end, so it had like a positive end. So um, we are, you're, you said a bit about, or talked a bit about deployment. Um, how, or, or who is deploying more than once a week? Keep your hands raised if it's more than once a day, more than 10 times a day, more than 20 times a day, more than 50, okay. Um, so how do, what are you doing now with deployment? How did you change it? Yeah, initially we were doing like six major deployments per year. Um, nowadays we are doing like uh, one per week in, in each site because we have multiple sites. But one per week when it comes to, let's say, customer, um, each customer. And what, what was there like um, cultural changes that you needed to do there for that as well? And for, how were they? And were they hard? Was it hard to convince people? And not only we had to change some applications as well. Sure. <laughs> uh, we had to change technologies. We had to bring some uh, yeah tools that that allowed us to actually do continuous deployment. Uh, but also, of course, uh, also it's about the mindset of developers because um, and not only because in the end we all understood that yeah it's better to have happy customers on our platform without any disturbances I suppose yeah. how is it uh, at Metro systems how is your deployment strategy there at the moment um, we do deployments currently as uh, often as possible I remember the time when we had uh, big releases which kind of broke m everything more than having continuous uh, deployments and deliveries. Uh, it really depends on, uh, on the team and on the velocity of the team. There are teams that uh, do deployments uh, once per day. There are teams that do deployments uh, at the end of a sprint. The sprint takes about two weeks, generally. Okay. Um you also said um, a couple of minutes ago that you are using a microservice architecture, right? Um, yes. Is does this help you? And how does this help you with deployment? Uh, did it help you for this with deployments? It uh, it helped us uh, a lot in uh, being able to deploy more often, as uh, the services are quite separated from one to to the other, and this is uh, this. Part of uh, Metro Systems Romania of the team is actually the one that does multiple deployments per week. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, how's it about you? Are you using a microservice architecture or more a monolithic architecture? Well, um, it's more towards monolithic, monolithic architectures uh, when it comes to, let's say, offline systems like billing system where, I don't know, you think about the change for three weeks and you write three lines of code, I suppose. Um, otherwise, we lean towards, uh, let's say, service type of architecture when it comes to front-end uh, applications like portal. Well, mm -hmm. um, especially with like inter um, 
I guess you also came from um, having like a, oftentimes what you hear is that you're coming uh, architecture-wise in a company from having like one monolithic application which is like hard to deploy, hard to scale and a lot of spaghetti code in the end. And um, then people read like the news and blog posts and say, hey, uh, like Netflix and Amazon, they are doing microservices and this like solves problems. Um, is this, uh, were there also like problems that arise uh, for you by introducing microservices? Uh, yes, yes. As uh, you might know already, when going to microservices, there are two approaches that can be taken. Either uh, just uh, leave uh, the monolith uh, un untouched and create uh, another um, application that does the same as the monolith does, built on microservices. Or, uh, Which then means rewriting basically everything. code that you actually yeah. wrote and reintroducing all the bugs that you already fixed, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Or uh, have the monolith uh, and see which are the main points that can be loosely coupled, that are loosely coupled and can be taken away and built on, uh, on microservices. And then start, start taking from the monolith uh, the parts parts of it in and we write it in microservices now at metro systems romania i guess we did both of uh, both of them and are still uh, doing because we have lots of uh, monolithic legacy applications that we need to rebuild in microservices if that is the case so if it's an, it's more feasible to rebuild in microservices. Uh, we will do it if it's more feasible to live with the monolith or with a hybrid between the monolith and the microservices, mm. then it should be possible. Mm. I think that is a very important point here uh, to take away from this being pragmatic and not dogmatic about a lot of uh, things. If you have a yeah. well-working monolithic application that you uh, where you can still change something, that's probably really still great. And a monolithic application is not per se bad or uh, not working, quite to the contrary. Uh. No, no, there are uh, mm. cases when the monolithic application works much better than having to split it between micro microservices, mm. such as big data processing, uh, such as uh, things that are built on whatever programming language that is not ready for microservices mm -hmm. yet yeah. and for a platform architecture. Uh, for you, having like a bit more of a monolithic approach there, um, what are your experiences with uh, microservices and problems you have with that? And Well, m mostly we have had, the, let's say, the Microsoft services approach on, on the front-end application, um, applications. As uh, my colleague said earlier, some of the applications, since they are offline, seem to be more stable and not that suitable to actually transform. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a cost that doesn't really work being invested, mm -hmm. basically. So, um, like maybe to speak also a bit about the problems and we had with microservices, uh, maybe you have like good solutions for me for that, is um, that at some point network overhead uh, can uh, become problematic because you have like a monolithic application and then everything is basically fast because everything can talk with everything and it's just a function call, which is like, uh, whereas uh, micro in microservice architecture, if you have different services that need to talk with each other in order to do something, like render a page or send an email or so, they actually have to talk with each other over something over the network, like HTTP. And for us, we quickly saw that can become problematic in terms of latency and uh, in terms of something or sometimes also stability and also like makes response times oftentimes. Uh, slower and become challenging. Uh, how do you handle these things? Uh, do, is this also problematic for you, or do you have the silver, the one thing that we should change to actually make it better? Well, uh, like inter-service communication. Yeah, I mean. as long as we make them scalable, it's it's fine for us. We are not that much into uh, into um, um, this approach, though. So. Uh, yeah, indeed, network latency and response times and response codes are a big are a big issue. How we handle it is that we ensure that we monitor it properly through uh, rate, latency rates, 
to uh, through response codes, rates to latency between the services. Like you, you when going to microservices, you also need to change a little bit the way you think about monitoring in uh, in general. Um, where well, we come back again to DevOps practices because building up monitoring infrastructure and all that is kind of like a DevOps practice and also looking at monitoring then. Um, who for all of you is doing like response time monitoring and know how fast or slow their pages are out of interest? Uh, okay, only a few. Do you have some questions maybe for us in terms of monitoring and what would be interesting for you? Uh, to know about it. Yeah, there's one over there. There's a microphone coming for the recording, sorry. What do you use for monitoring? Um, okay, I guess that goes to all of us. Um, so uh, we use an open source graph database called Graphite, uh, which is very good at storing uh, metric series and very efficient in that. And then we just store everything in there, measure everything. So we measure um, response times of separate pages, and also how long uh, database queries took, uh, how long HTTP calls to other services took, and we measure all that, store all that, um, and have all kinds of insights, and then build up dashboards around that. Uh, we use uh, mainly Prometheus and, uh, and Grafana, or uh, a mixture of other uh, monitoring tools, like we have also Graphite in some of the projects, we have Nagios in, uh, in others, uh, we have external monitoring for, uh, for the front ends, like Pingdom or any other mm -hmm. uh, type of monitoring. What is the reason that you're having like a several solutions there, uh, because this is one thing we are doing, this, all these microservices that are independent from each other, what we thought okay. about, okay, uh, for this infrastructure thing, we are trying to centralize on one solution. So you're doing a different approach there. Uh, uh, yeah, I mentioned different solutions because uh, at Metro Systems, we don't only build one application, we build the entire uh, IT landscape for Metro Group, and it really depends on uh, the if it's a CRM system or if it's a, a monolith that we have built, uh, we have integrated DevOps in, or if it's microservices. F uh, for microservices themselves, we mainly use uh, Prometheus and, uh, and Grafana. Mm -hmm. And what do you use at Ericsson? Um, Elasticsearch with Kibana for the applications list, you know, more closer to microservice mm -hmm. concept. And for all the other applications, we uh, basically use um, quite the same patent. It's only that uh, we use uh, internal applications, meaning that we have a log unifier that it's shown in an in a internal application, mm -hmm. basically throwing alerts and. and okay. Um, I guess also one answer to your question could be again: um, it does not matter so much as long as you get the data somewhere. <laughs> But yeah. of course, it's yeah. interesting to know what tools uh, use. Any other question in terms of monitor? Yeah, over I'm curious. Um, from what point do you collect data? I mean, do you get it from the load balancer or do you get it at application level? Uh, for us, both. For, okay. So we take uh, data from the. We actually write data, measure it directly in the applications. Uh, we also take uh, data from the load balancer logs. We take take system metrics like CPU, memory time, and so on. So everything basically. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, yeah, to me, to yeah. me as well. So okay. everything. Yeah. And you, for, you can't have like too little amount of monitoring data. And for the application layer, do you have like a framework um, that your developers use to have monitoring plug and play, or do they um, write some plugins or some connectors for the monitoring system to send their I don't know RPMs or something like that? Um, so. Basically, like monitoring something is taking a, like a time point somewhere, and the, when something starts, and then a time point when something ends, and the, the difference of that is then that what you want to monitor. And then there's like a, we use a library per program we have one library to actually send the data to Graphite, um, and then of course we add this to things like the ORM system for talking to databases, for example, so that we don't have to do this by hand everywhere we do an SQL query, but it's done automatically. Uh, yeah, we also have libraries, and starting uh, this week, uh, the developers for the microservices were requested to 
add an abstraction layer uh, for the library so that uh, we can be very flexible on the monitoring solution that, uh, that we would provide. Since, Promethe uh, since Prometheus is pool-based, then uh, we just scrape an endpoint where they display what's, what's needed from their side. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question there regarding um, what you said, like framework and building abstractions. So when we started Microsoft, we thought, okay, okay um, this is great because everyone can use like uh, their own programming language for what is needed and their own frameworks and that. And then we noticed at some point this is like a bit of a nightmare because people, someone started the service writing it in Scala. Um, basically, he was the only one who knew anything about Scala. Then he was on vacation for four weeks and nobody could do anything in the application easily anymore. So we are actually going back now, having still these separate services, but still standardizing the stack way more now, even down to using the same uh, frameworks and the same libraries everywhere. Um, is this something also, how is this for you uh, guys or girls? Uh, normally, if you have uh, a vertical that is uh, building either an application or part of an application, then that application is standardized. I mean, uh, we have uh, services that are built in uh, Scala, as you mentioned, not that many though. Uh, but we also have services built in uh, Java or even Go, Golang. Um, but normally, if, there is, if, uh, if the services come from an application, then they are built in the same programming language. Okay, and within one programming language, are you standardizing there then on frameworks? Yes. Okay, so not it's like not completely freedom and wild west thing. Okay. No, not really. Okay, how is it for you uh, in the front end quite, services? Quite, quite similar. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions that you guys have? Yeah, here in the front as well. Thank you. One question uh, related to Graphite and Prometheus for the Java-based application, which is the best. Could you put the microphone a bit? Sorry. <laughs> for the Java-based application, which is the best uh, tool, Graphite or uh, Prometheus, to use? Uh, what are the differences between them? I guess I'm going to answer with the one answer that to every programming-related qu uh, question. It depends, uh, I guess. Yeah, it really, it really depends a bit. Um, also, if you have something already up and running and it's working out for you, don't change it, because then you're losing historical data and but stuff. But if you want to start with one of them? Um, I guess uh, if I would start now fresh, I would look into Prometheus more uh, instead of Graphite, just because it works nicer together with Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, that is one of the reasons. Is Graphite uh, push or pool-based? Uh, push-based. Uh, Prometheus is, uh, is pool-based, mm -hmm. which gives a lot of more flexibility. And as uh, Bastian said, it's built based on Prometheus because it comes from the same, uh, same company. Mm -hmm. um, maybe also, the, of course, if, if Graphite is push-based, but you can still have like a small daemon that pulls data and then pushes it to Graphite. So. This is also and if doable. You, if you have a graphite already, a graphite database, yeah. you can build exporters for Prometheus ah. uh, to, to take the data and transform it in the time series format that is used in Prometheus. I guess mm -hmm. both of them are time series databases. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this is that's this answer a bit your question. Yes, thank you. Very <laughs> okay. Much. Um, also, what we are just saying now, saying like Graphite, Prometheus, like in one year probably there's going to be something better or different out there uh, that is maybe nicer. And even uh, there are platform as a service tools like, for example, Librato, where you pay per metric, that could be also fine, especially if you're working in an agency. It's maybe easier to, instead of setting this up all yourself, to just use a platform as a service provider, which you then can just directly build to your client, uh, because it's just not so much operational overhead. Um, also, we had been talking about deployments a bit. Is, uh, do you have questions about deployments and deployment infrastructure, continuous delivery? No? Okay, if, just raise your hand if you, if you have something in between. Um, we also already talked, like, very quickly, I mentioned Kubernetes, and in terms of like deployment and DevOps principles, especially does do tools like Docker and Kubernetes help you there? Are you using this? Yes, yes, for the microservices, we use Kubernetes uh, and Docker. 
Uh, so they uh, they scale very well and they heal quite quite okay. I mean, I really like the the feature from Kubernetes that if uh, the service does not uh, respond to a health check, then it automatically deletes the pod and recreates it without any hassle mm -hmm. from from any operations uh, person. Yeah, um, how is it for you? Same with OpenShift on top. I okay. Did you have any problems running Docker and Kubernetes in production? Um, because we are running at the moment Docker and Kubernetes only on staging systems and not in production yet. So this will probably be a Q3 or Q4 thing for us. So it would be interesting to get uh, your experiences there. Well, we've been using it in production for two months now. So maybe it's not the best <laughs> historical <Okay>. path. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, we have had no problems up until now. Okay. Also fine, okay. Um, also what would be interesting for me again, um, Kubernetes now since like, I don't know, four, three months or so, or four months has like the possibility to have horizontal auto-scaling so that you can have like certain metric points and then if that goes over a configurable threshold that uh, Kubernetes will just power, uh, boot up new pods up not until like a maximum that you can configure. Have you used this? Have you experienced with that? We are playing with it uh, right now, so we are not using it in uh, in production uh, so so far. Uh, we defined a threshold, and yeah, if it reaches uh, that threshold, then Kubernetes sp spins up another pod for uh, for it, which I find also really mm -hmm. really great and uh, and helpful in okay. uh, DevOps work. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, quite similar, okay. actually, testing the acceptance. How is the development workflow with Docker images and uh, putting them in Kubernetes for your services? Who writes the Docker files and who manages the Docker files for Office service for Ty you? Typically, in our, land, uh, in our setup, it's the developers doing this. So the developers of the actual service, they are also responsible yeah. for writing the Docker file. So that goes back then actually to having the DevOps principles in place. Yeah. Um, how do we ensure that um, in these Docker files there are, they use versions that are not insecure and don't have any uh, known security vulnerabilities? Because if everyone writes their own Docker files and they may use outdated Java versions, outdated uh, operating system versions, out, uh, outdated open SSH, uh, open SSL versions and stuff, how do you ensure to have not security vulnerabilities in there? Well, if I mean, if you ask me, uh, we do have a special security team that basically audits them, but I don't really know exactly how. Mm -hmm. But I, I can tell you that, yeah. Okay, how are we doing that? Uh, there is on the one side the security team that handles the pure uh, security parts, and so uh, we in, uh, reliabil in the reliability engineering team are currently building a conformity monkey that would check all the, the services uh, in order to, to ensure that everything is up to date and, and running properly. Are you basing this on some kind of already existing open source will, um, tool or is it like completely no. new? No, oh. I only mentioned Conformity Monkey for, for people that know about the Netflix's uh, monkeys. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, the Chaos Monkey and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's purely built on premises by the reliability engineering mm -hmm. team using Go. Do you have plans to open source it? Uh, because that could be actually like a really interesting uh, thing also for other companies. Probably, yes. Okay. If yes, please uh, send me a message. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but I also know there is one vulnerability scanning, I forgot the name, that also uh, can scan Docker images for known, uh, for tools or libraries uh, or packages that have known vulnerabilities, but I forgot the name. I think it's like wall scan or something like that, oh. that I know of. But Probably. Yeah, so, uh, as I said, like we are just starting the staging system, so this is like not the topmost priority at the moment uh, yet. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I have to. Do you have any more questions? Uh, do you have any questions about Docker Kubernetes or who is using Docker in production? Maybe. Uh, no, I'm not using it in production. So, only like one, two. Um, but yeah, questions around Kubernetes, Docker, and all these exciting container things. Yeah, I have a question um, in regards to the orchestrators. What do you use for the networking layer? Do you use the overlay network or you have your own networking plugins? So I'll repeat the question. Mm -hmm. So 
what do you use for networking when using orchestrators? Do you use the Calico overlay network or whatever overlay network comes with uh, Kubernetes or Docker? Or do you use um, your barebone um, networking interface? So we're using the Kubernetes networking interface. I also don't think that in Kubernetes you can get around using that easily. Yes. This is like the whole point, one of the points of Kubernetes that it abstracts the whole networking thing uh, that you would need to configure with just using Docker yourself. It abstracts it away from you so you don't have to care about that anymore um, and encapsulates this uh, in a proper way. Um, so I want to go with uh, other questions about Kubernetes and Docker and mentions there. Okay, um, I want to go back a bit to the microservice things because there's like one or two things I want to ask about that. Um, so microservices are really great because you can have different technology stacks and all of that and uh, decouple deployments, scale them easier. Um, one thing that is a bit of a downside, despite the um, latency issues that can arise there is uh, how what happens when you do have to do bigger refactorings that across actually multiple services. Of course, ideally they should be all independent, but it's probably not always the case. So how do you handle these cases when you have refactorings that go across a lot of services and you have to synchronize that kind of? We haven't had the refactories so uh, so far, so I cannot okay. answer that. So just not doing them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we we are just doing them, and so I I guess it will be based on the uh, pipeline that uh, that we are using, since refactoring means that uh, you will have to redeploy a lot. Uh, the pipeline uses a mechanism that makes it always available no matter what what you deploy by spanning other pods for deployment and then mm -hmm. switching between them. Okay. Um, do you have any refactoring experience with your front-end microservice or service mm, architecture? Not oh. lately. We basically changed the application altogether. It's built from scratch. Okay. We just replaced it. I, I wouldn't call it refactoring. Mm. Okay. But, yeah, in theory, I think it's... it's I've, since it's independent, it can easily be picked up service by service or microservice by microservice and mm -hmm. refactor. Okay, um, great. So we talked a lot about like different things with deployment, Kubernetes, microservices. Um, I want to go back to the DevOps principles in general. When, from your experience, when introducing DevOps principles in an organization, are there, how are the costs? How, how expensive is it to actually do this? Uh, and how does it compare to the benefits? Whoever wants Thank to start you. first. Okay, so um, I initially started by explaining that, okay, we were built up as a team, um, just for, uh, well, mainly for picking up the leftovers between the chairs or whatever is fell, falling between uh, dev and ops. Uh, and if we're speaking about, uh, strictly about cost-wise, it's kind of small. It's uh, compared to dev organizations and um, classic ops organization, like 3%, I think. Okay. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but to implement the methodology or, yeah, the mindset of DevOps uh, throughout the entire organization, well, I suppose that the benefits come from the customer experience, basically, mm -hmm. because it brings continuous uh, deployments and, yeah, mm -hmm. basically, the, this is the thing. How was it at Metro Systems? Well, about the costs, I guess uh, the highest cost uh, that that you will have when starting a DevOps culture is the change management cost. Uh, you you really need to have a higher management involvement, and you really need to communicate a lot about uh, about the changes and create the mindset of DevOps inside the company. So change management is a big part there. The benefits after uh, the DevOps organization is built are, I guess, more than, than the costs with, uh, with change management. Mm -hmm. um, you also said like you have a DevOps team now and also it spreads around a bit more. Is this a plan that at some point every uh, developer should be kind of like a DevOps engineer at Metro Systems at some point? 
to really spread this through the whole organization or how are your plans for the future there? Yes, for, uh, for now how we, we started with the DevOps transformation is getting uh, the DevOps teams together, so getting the developers together with operations at the same, uh, same um, office. And uh, then um, how many offices do you have here in Romania? Uh, there are seven floors of offices, so we are about 800 people. That's why I'm talking wow. about the big <laughs> organization. <laughs> okay, that's really big, yeah. But in one place here in Bucharest. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we we are also an international organization, so we yeah. also work off, uh, with uh, in teams that are not necessarily based in uh, in Romania. Um, Getting, getting the developers uh, together with, uh, with operations at, uh, at one point is though not sufficient enough. They, they need to start really working together so that the developers get to know the um, pure operations mindset and the operations mindset need to learn development as well so that mm -hmm. everybody is on the same page uh, during scrums. Uh, we do scrum, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, scrum ceremonies and uh, everybody can take from the product, product uh, backlog any any story. So mm -hmm. that, that is the target. There are teams currently doing this. There are teams that uh, are in transformation, in a transformation period. So not, not all the teams in uh, Metro Systems Romania are really purely DevOps teams in terms of you, you have a DevOps guy that does development mm -hmm. and operations. Okay. Um, is there any kind of problems in terms of um, kind of operational DevOps stories in Scrum, uh, prioritizing them against like feature stories, product stories, uh, and what do product managers, um, like product product managers, think about that? Yeah, you you know that uh, working software is always better than a nice software that doesn't work. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> stability is uh, one of the main main topics of any product team uh, in in Romania, and performance performance as well. Mm, that's great. How is it at, at Ericsson? What are your plans for the future in terms of? Well, fostering a DevOps actually culture. Actually, already started with uh, some virtual teams that mm -hmm. are basically yeah, cross um, organizational, meaning that we have developers, operations, and DevOps in, in the same team working together. Um, what I would add, what else it brings, at least up until now, is maintainability or operability. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point. Mm -hmm. And, well, uh, maybe a short story about this uh, because yeah. it it comes also about the, let's say management decisions and uh, um, since we are not set up in, in a linear way um, I was participating participating on a discussion between a manager in ops and the manager in, in dev where the manager in ops said okay I prefer to cut off ten of my guys just to give you three guys in development and help us build a maintainable and automatic solution end to end. So this is the kind of approach that we are trying by building those teams, basically. Mm, okay, um, so maybe like for me as a last question is, so I'm a developer now, or I'm an operations guy now, what kind of skill set do I need to, like if I say like, DevOps is great, so I wanna like go more into this direction myself for a career change, what skill sets does one need for that? Is there, are there special skills that what should I learn? Well, if I'm considering a, um, an operations guy with some experience, uh, in the traditional setup, um, usually um, had uh, the, the possibility of actually writing code and building his own, uh, let's say, uh, play toys like monitoring tools, uh, check, check, uh, check uh, checkers uh, around the platform that were built basically on top of uh, the standard product. The problematic part was that, oh, okay, each and every deployment, even though it was happening uh, every two months or every three months or every six months, might have uh, bring some problems in his own scripting or monitoring. So um, the main thing here, I think, is that Ops has also the possibility not only to bring the, let's say, the um, knowledge on the production setup as such, 
It also has the ability to write code uh, and also deliver it as per the standard development methodologies, whatever they are. Mm. So basically, it's all in one. Well, uh, the benefits on the developer side, it's also clear because it has the possibility to be tied together with operations and basically understand better the problems that operations guys mm. have generally. Okay. Um, maybe you uh, talked a lot about like what I have to learn as an operations guy, like with development methodologies. Is there like one thing where you say for me as a developer to go into DevOps that I really should look into, I should learn? Yeah, generally I wanted to talk about uh, the um, soft skills that are needed. So the, the most important ones from my point of view are flexibility and pragmatism. This, mm. uh, this you really need inside the team. Then communication, because communication in DevOps is really important, pair programming as much as you can. Which also spreads knowledge then again and uh, keeps people learning, yeah. Um, so, do we, have, do we have questions more for us? Yes, over here. Hi. Uh, so uh, you were talking about microservices and about Kubernetes and Docker. So since you were talking about microservices, so maybe some scaling going on there. Uh, I'm just, and also you talked about deployment. Uh, I'm just curious, how does it work deployment for you? How, how does the uh, deployment work for you in a uh, scaled environment like microservices. So basically, when you are doing a deployment, you, deployment you are basically uh, replacing an old version with a new version. So how do you replace old versions of microservices with new ones? How does it work for you? Um, maybe I can start there. Um, first of all, Kubernetes makes this fairly easy because um, it has a rolling deployment strategy already built in. So it will tear down some instances of the service and power up new, the new instances of the new version and then slowly rolling out and keep the service available through all times. Um, of course, what you have to keep in mind then that uh, basically if you deploy something new, some changes, they should always be backwards compatible or API versioned or feature, using feature flex for that. So it's then vitally important so that you're not breaking services that actually depend on something there, on, on this other service that you are changing. Anything you want to add to it? Or? That was a perfect okay. answer. <laughs> okay, thanks. Any other question? I think we have maybe time for one more or two. Um, if not, then you definitely can also grab us like outside in the networking area. I guess um, you also have both a booth here from Ericsson and Metro System, which are also directly across from each other. So maybe just visit them. They're going to be hanging around there. And there is going to be an after party where at least I'm going to be there. Like as a proper drum, I have to drink beer there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much, guys, for your time.